Hello, and welcome to the recordings at Risk Recipient Information Award. We'll begin by introducing the staff on the call today. My name is Kristen Blair, and I'm the Program Administrator at CLEAR, and I'll be moderating, moderating the webinar. I'm joined by our geographically distributed grants team members, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves now. Hi, I'm Sharon Burney. I'm the Program Assistant with the CLEAR grants team. Hi, I'm Joy Banks. I am a program officer uh, with the CLEAR Grants team. Hi, everybody. I'm Becca Kwan, also a program officer, um, and I'm looking forward to this webinar. We'd like to begin by first congratulating you all once again on being selected for the grant recipient for the Recordings at Risk program. We've had a varied and remarkable collection of projects represented here, and we're very happy to be working with all of you. Our team thought it would be helpful to touch base as you begin your project to clarify some of the responsibilities as grantees and to discuss how to handle certain situations that may arise in the future. We'll begin the presentation by covering aspects of the reporting requirements, then we'll move on to information regarding grant modifications, the exit interview, and some additional notes on helping us promote your project. Some logistics for using the Zoom platform today. If you haven't already, if you, you can hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen to find buttons that open the chat and the Q&A boxes. Feel free to add any comments in the chat box at any time, changing the settings to everyone if you'd like your message to be seen by the entire group. We'll be taking questions in the Q&A box, which allows participants to upvote the question if several people have the same one. We'll answer your questions submitted through the Q&A box at the, end of, at the end of the webinar. We'll also be recording this session so that you can revisit it in the future or share it with colleagues. I'll now turn it over to Joy, who will be starting the presentation. Thanks, Kristen. Um, so we always like to start our sessions by reminding everyone of CLEAR's mission. The Council on Library and Information Resources, or CLEAR, is an independent nonprofit organization that forges strategies to enhance research, teaching, and learning environments in collaboration with libraries, cultural institutions, and communities of higher learning. So the Recordings at Risk program is just one of many programs administered by CLEAR and is generously supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We have continued support for this program through the spring of 2021. So do be sure to tell your friends and colleagues if they're interested. And we just opened Cycle 7's call for proposals and our next deadline for submissions is January 31st, 2020. Um, so before we dive into our presentation, I did want to point you towards the Recordings at Risk recipient resources webpage. Uh, in much the same way as the applicant resources page helped guide your proposal writing, the recipient resources page is sort of a one-stop shop for grant recipients with information on the administrative components of holding a clear grant. Most of the information we'll be covering today can be found there if you ever need a refresher on our policies. And also, importantly, the recording of this webinar will also be posted on this page if you ever want to go back to reference it. We'll begin by going over CLEAR's reporting requirements for grantees. Since most of you are just starting your projects or maybe have not yet started them, it may seem a bit odd to start with reporting, but sometimes seeing what will be required at the end of your grant may help you decide how to document progress and keep metrics, which may hopefully make the reporting easier when your projects are complete. You were all awarded grants this fall in the sixth Recording at Risk competition. So for that reason, you will hear us refer to you as a group as our Cycle 6 recipients. To keep things sort of easier for everyone, we start by setting everyone on the same year-long project timeline with all of the same deadlines. So regardless of the project length that you originally proposed, we've really found that this is um, easier for everyone and sort of more in line with what we've seen uh, for project lengths. 
So you might have suggested a project that would be between three and 12 months, uh, but everybody has been given a, a project length of 12 months. So all of your start dates were October 1st, 2019. Act activities for all cycle six projects must be completed no later than September 30th, 2020. And these dates were all included in your award letters. This includes all approved project activities, including digitization, metadata creation, and providing whatever access you're, you've uh, agreed to in your proposal. Grant funds may only be expended during this 12 month period. And to change this timeline, you'll need to get approval from us, which we'll cover shortly. With very few exceptions, there's only one report required for this program. Your final report form and financial assessment uh, are due within 30 to 90 days of project completion. So this would mean that the latest possible reporting deadline would be December 31st, 2020. You may find that your project ends earlier than September 30th, 2020, so that's the project end date, or that you're ready to submit your report earlier than September 31st, 2020, which is the reporting deadline. You're always more than welcome to submit your final report early if that's the case, and we will congratulate you for that, um, but you will need to contact the CLEAR Grants team at our program account, which is recordings at risk at clear.org, uh, so we can start the reporting process, and we'll be sure to put that uh, email address in a few different places so you have it. Grant reports are submitted through the same portal you used to submit your application, which is called SM Apply. You can also find a link to this on the recipient resources page on the Recordings at Risk website. All communication and reminders for reporting will be sent to the primary principal investigator or PI that was named in your proposal, but there's no limit really to the number of other project staff that can be kept in the loop. If there are any other individuals involved in project work who need such notifications, you'll just need to send us uh, a message to our program email address, um, send us the names and contact information for those people. Please share this information as soon as possible so we can keep our records up to date and you can send it at any time if new people are added over the course of your project. If you can, we would recommend logging in to SM Apply uh, using the same email address and password you use to create your application. If you use these same credentials, you should automatically see the reporting form for your project when you log in. If you've forgotten these credentials or for whatever reason lose access to them, uh, so if the person who created your application perhaps has left your organization, you will need to contact us through the program email address so that we can link your report to the correct credentials. An additional way to sort of future proof your team is to um, access the report now. So log in using the application credentials, hit start to pretend like you're starting your report, and then you have the ability to add other team members' email address as collaborators in, in much the same way that you could do that on the application. Collaborators will then receive an automatic invitation to verify their email address and create their own passwords to access the system. Once they do this, they will also be able to log in to view the report and enter data. However, one of the system's safety measures ensures that only the primary principal investigator is actually able to submit the report. So if one of the collaborators eventually needs to submit, um, you just need to contact us to make sure that this can happen. So now that we've sort of done, done the overview of the system, we're going to sort of go on a tour of the reporting form itself. The first section, oh wait, that's not the right slide. I think we went backwards. <laughs> there we go. So the first section of the report is the quantitative assessment. Here you'll be entering information related to the numbers and types of recordings nominated for digitization, 
the number of archival master files produced, and variances between estimated and actual digitization numbers. To complete this part, it will be helpful to have access to your original proposal for your project. Taking the time now to put a copy of your proposal in a place where all the team members can access it is probably a good idea. You can download a copy of your proposal by logging into the system using those same credentials that you use to create your application. And if you don't know where to find a copy of your proposal, you can send, um, send us an email and we can help you with that. The next section of the report um, is going to be about documenting project developments. There we go, internal developments, uh, both internal and public. So internal developments may include things like digitization metrics that you've used to track time data, steps in the project workflow, um, such as preparing materials for the vendor, metadata creation, perhaps the implementation of new workflows, standards, protocols, and procedures for digitization and description, the implementation of new tools or systems, and maybe even new donations or grant applications. CLEAR pulls together the data about the impact of its program for its own annual reporting to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So providing as many details as possible um, that on how this opportunity has affected your organization, collections, staff, and ways of working will be very helpful to us. Taking notes somewhere about the impact of this grant will help you easily complete this section. Some of the public developments that we've thought about are perhaps the creation of new blogs, social media accounts, websites, or perhaps just content for existing ones, research guides, online or physical ex exhibitions, or news articles, the incorporation of digitized materials into curricula or any at any educational level, or maybe publications or presentations about the project or arising from research using the digitized materials. Again, keeping a file with copies of these kinds of documentation will make the reporting process easy for you. You'll also have a chance to append copies of these documents to your report, demonstrating the varied and creative ways you'll use your project to educate and serve others. Here's just a quick glimpse of what these impact questions look like on the reporting form. The report form includes basic checkboxes to document activity, which you'll then have the opportunity to explain further in the narrative portion of your report. So here's the checklist for internal impacts and then the checklist for public outcomes. Because Recordings at Risk is designed to support smaller scale efforts really focused on preservation reformatting of audio and audiovisual materials over short periods of time, CLEAR does not expect that all of these things will happen in the course of your work. Most recipients just check two or three boxes here and some don't really check any at all and that's okay. Just check any box that do apply to you so we'll know uh, to look for them in your narrative and to account for them in our own summary reporting to the Mellon Foundation. Next, we ask grant recipients to share with us where users can go to find information about the digital copies of the recordings reformatted through your project. Some of you will be providing public access to both the digital files and the associated metadata created through your project. And some may only be providing public access to the metadata. This is a good place to stop and remind everyone that creating and providing access to metadata for the digital copies of the recordings created through your project is a requirement of the program unless a specific exception was made in your proposal for cultural reasons. CLEAR expects that you will create and publish online at least some basic metadata for the digital copies of the recordings so people can learn about what you have. 
At the end of your project, you may still have work to do to add richer descriptions, subject headings, or even transcriptions or captions, but we do expect that some basic record about what you've done be posted somewhere online. You'll have the option to include up to 10 URLs in the report section. We encourage you to provide a few high level links to the collections rather than many lower level links. These links just allow us to verify that you have made metadata at the least uh, um, accessible, um, as well as verify that those of you who can make the digital surrogates of recordings available for streaming online have done so. Again, we do understand that for some of you, legal and ethical issues will make it impossible to provide full access to copies of your recordings. If this is the case, um, you just need to provide one or more links to where your metadata is at the end of your project. You can also provide more information about future locations of your metadata and files in the narrative sections of your report. Next, you'll provide contact information for the project PIs, the service provider, and the person who should be contacted if questions emerge about the report. After that, you'll add your financial narrative and either uh, save this section of the form or mark it complete. The financial narrative should address each line in your project budget, and we'll go over that shortly. Marking the report as complete will take you to the review page where you can double check the information that you entered and see the additional steps that you need to take. There are a few documents to upload before you'll be ready to submit your report. If you look at the left hand side of the screen, uh, you'll be able to see the buttons that will prompt you to upload the remaining components of the report, which we'll go over one by one now. The first and perhaps most important part of your project, uh, of, of your report, sorry, is the project narrative. This will be an uploaded document of no more than six pages, which will contain the types of information listed here, um, a summary of the project and purpose of your grant, your progress toward the expected outcomes, where you can explain the numbers, that, um, including any var variances that you had in the quantitative section, any surprises, setbacks, challenges that you faced, significant accomplishments and lessons learned, and then finally, your future plans. Ultimately, this information, uh, this is information that will help us create resources that can be of use to other institutions wanting to initiate their own AV digitization projects. We'll also share the lessons learned from grantees with our funder, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, that does receive all of the reports. If you take the time to compile notes somewhere about these topics during the course of your project and save those notes in the same place you keep a copy of the original proposal, you'll probably thank yourself later when the final report deadline approaches. Next up, uh, uh, we have a screenshot of the uh, section where you'll be asked to upload the project narrative. You'll notice this does include directions about all the topics that your narrative report should cover. You'll also be asked to upload a project manifest, a spreadsheet which includes the names and locations of the digital files uh, normally the access copies, as well as notations about any checksums and restrictions. We require this because we're we've developing a tool, uh, sort of a web crawler, that allows us to conduct periodic checks that the online files created through CLEAR's digitization regranting programs are, in fact, online. Note that CLEAR's template for this does have multiple tabs, uh, and one of them does include instructions, so do be sure to read through all of those tabs. Taking a look at this template now, uh, which you can get through the report form in SM Apply or through the recipient resources page, and then building in time to create this document into your workflow 
will help you save time later. Uh, normally, your digitization vendor will return some sort of spreadsheet to you that will be very similar to what you need to submit here, and you should be able to adapt the vendor spreadsheet for this template. If you work out your file naming conventions at the start and ensure your vendor names uh, and ensure your vendor names your files exactly according to your needs. Most of your work for this requirement will already be done. If you leave this until the end, uh, it might take some scrambling to pull it all together. So we do strongly recommend coming up with a strategy for compiling this data during the course of project work. Of all of the pieces of the final report, this is the document which allows us to verify that you have created all of the deliverables agreed upon when you receive funding. If in the midst of your project, um, you have issues that come up that will affect your ability to reach the goals included in your application, reach out to us, um, to the Clear Grants team, so that we can help you decide the best course of action and we'll go over how to do that in a little bit, uh, but first let's just finish up with the report form. The final part of the reporting requirements that I wanna to touch on is the financial assessment, which contains two parts. So the first was the financial narrative, which we glimpsed at just a little bit ago and the main report form. In the financial narrative, you can comment on actual grant expenditures during the reporting period as they relate to your proposed budget. Every budget category should be addressed here, and if there are any variances of 5% or more between projected and actual spending, do make sure to include a detailed explanation here. This would also be where you would explain any sort of modifications that you might have approved, um, which again, we'll talk about shortly. The second part of the financial report, which is an upload using the same budget and financial report template that you submitted with your proposal. The only difference here is that you have uh, both the budgeted and actual columns of the template filled out uh, for the final report. This is another good reason to make sure that you have a copy of your entire proposal saved somewhere uh, where all of your team members can access it. So you'll prepare the financial report beginning with the same file that you submitted with your proposal. If for any reason you lose access to that, just let us know and we can help you. This slide just has um, a reminder of what the budget and financial reporting form looks like. It's very important that you use this template for your financial report rather than any sort of internal financial reporting forms your institutions may have. Note uh, again that there's the budgeted column for the information submitted with your proposal and then the actual column for the information about what you spend during the grant term. Some of you may find that you don't spend all of the grant funds and that's okay. Uh, however, it do expect you, uh, CLEAR does require that you return any unexpended funds at the time that you submit your final report. We noted earlier that SM Apply does allow you to add other email addresses for collaborators who will contribute to your report. So um, as you develop it in the system. We do recognize though that sometimes it isn't realistic to expect all members of the team to figure out how to log in and use the system. For that reason, we've also created a Google Doc template that your team can use to prepare your draft report. The document includes the full information requested in the report, covering both the questions on the reporting form and the documents that will be added as uploads. Uh, you may remember using a similar document to prepare your proposal, and it's the same principle here. Uh, you just want to make a personal copy of it that you can share with your team and then uh, when your team is happy with your report, just copy and paste from the document into SM Apply to submit your report. 
We'll be working on updating this a little bit to align more with uh, the way that we've uh, created the application template and guidelines. Um, right now, this is separated. Um, it's not quite in line with how things appear in SM Apply, so we'll be updating this a bit to make it look uh, more like what you'll encounter in the system. You can access this Google Doc template using the link on our Recordings at Risk recipient resources page. And uh, to make a personal copy, you can edit. You'll just click on the text that says click here to make a copy of this document. Um, you can also export it right from Google uh, if you want to save it to your own computer. The copy can then be shared with anyone who will be collaborating on the draft proposal. And then um, once you've uh, completed it, you'll just want to make sure that you do submit it through the SM Apply system. And now I'm going to pass things over to Becca. Thank you, Joy. Um, now that we've made it through the reporting form, uh, we need to address how you can make changes to your plans if unforeseen delays, problems, or staffing changes happen during the course of your work. Over the course of many grant projects, we've seen that the need often arises to request these modifications due to the unpredictability of audio and audiovisual digitization initiatives. Uh, such as such requests are extremely common for this program and you should not hesitate to ask us for what you need to do um, <clears throat> to successfully complete your project. CLEAR has an online modification request form uh, through which recipients can notify us of any modifications such as no cost extensions, PI changes, and reallocation requests. The form was designed to streamline the process and reduce the amount of time spent making and approving these requests. Access to the grant modification and extension request form is available through a link at the top of the recipient resources webpage. The same form is used across CLEAR grant programs and is designed to allow for the request of multiple types of modifications. The form includes sections on descriptive information, questions about extensions, other modification requests, and a space to provide a brief explanation and justification for your request. In order to prepare the necessary info, um, we also provide a template for these forms linked uh, to this slide and also available uh, on the recipient resources page. This slide shows the Google Doc template uh, for these requests. The online form does involve some question logic, so you may not be required to answer all of the questions that are on the template, depending on how you answer others. A link is provided at the top of, top of the document that allows you to create a copy of the template for collaborative working. All modification requests should be submitted through the online form, so you'll need to copy and paste your prepared responses into that section. Here's a glimpse of what the grant modification and extension request form looks like. In many cases, completing the form will be all you need to do to get approval for a modification. However, under certain circumstances, additional documentation may be required in order to move forward with a request. Multiple types of requests can be submitted at the same time using the same form. For example, if you need to request a no-cost extension as well as a reallocation of funds, the form will accommodate both requests. Once the form has been submitted and received, you should hear from CLEAR staff within two weeks. The guidelines for modification requests vary slightly between CLEAR's different grant programs, so be sure to check the recipient resources page for the most up-to-date information about this program. If you have any questions about the process, CLEAR staff is always available via email through our program email address, which again is recordings at risk at clear.org. Now for some additional information about the types of modification requests. Um, First is no cost extensions. These are allowed in the case of unforeseen delays, such as hiring or vendor processing delays. These are very common, but it's important to understand that you can only receive one extension per project. It may be useful to set a calendar reminder now to help you remember to evaluate whether or not you'll need to request an extension as your project end date approaches. 
For those who may be new to grants, a project end date is not the same as your reporting deadline. The project end date is the date by which all project work should be complete. It's important that extension requests are submitted about four to six weeks prior to the project's end date, which uh, for everyone again is uh, around September 30th, 2020. Even if you've spent all the grant funds, you'll need an extension request. You'll need an extension if you require additional time to complete your proposed project deliverables, including making metadata for your project available online. If all project deliverables are not complete by the end date, you will need an extension. If you need to switch principal investigators at any time, please let us know as soon as possible by creating the grant modification form. All CLEAR's grants ma grant management tasks require current contact details for every grant's principal investigator. So it's important we know when a PI departs your organization and their responsibilities are transferred to someone else. In order to complete the change of PI, you'll also be required to supply via email a letter from the head of the institution or department on institutional letterhead. This letter should include the name, title, and contact information of the new PI, as well as the date the change will become effective. A CV for the new PI will also be required for our file. On occasion, grantees find it necessary to spend grant funds in a manner other than originally proposed in their application. For example, vendor services may cost more or less than originally budgeted. Reallocations of grant funds are allowable, but these changes must be approved by CLEAR staff prior to the reallocation funds being spent. In cases where a budget surplus remains after the original deliverables have been met, you will have the option of either returning the surplus funds to us at CLEAR or submitting a budget reallocation request that proposes how the remaining funds will be spent. Any proposed use of the funds should be aligned with the original goals and scope of the project and within the current guidelines for allowable and disallowable costs for the Recordings at Risk program. The first step for a reallocation request is completing the grant modification form where you can explain the rationale for the reallocation and how it's consistent with the original proposal. Clear staff encourages spending surplus funds on additional digitization of material or increased spending for another previously approved line item in the project budget rather than adding a new line item. If a mutually satisfactory reallocation solution can't be found, uh, the remaining funds must be returned to clear. Note that small reallocations amounting to less than 5% of the total project budget and within the program guidelines do not require a formal reallocation request, but we do ask that you explain these variances in your final report. If questions arise about whether or not you need official approval of a reallocation, we are always available through email. In some rare instances, such as when a reallocation request involves a new budget line item, our team will require the completion of an updated budget document. This is going to be the same budget template you use to complete your application. Clear staff can provide a copy of it to you if you need it. This uh, new budget will replace the one submitted with your application. Some info will remain the same, such as your project start date and award amount. You will need to update any lines where you're proposing a change in amount and add any additional lines as needed if you're proposing a new spending category. In some cases, reallocations may happen when the already approved line within the already approved line item. When that's the case, we likely won't require the submission of a new budget document. An explanation of the challenges of the changes submitted through the grant modification form and your final report will suffice. When filling it out, be sure to include the name and title of the person filling out the form. Institutional shared costs should not be included on the budget form, which is also true when you're completing your final financial report. Within a few months of following, 
following the submission of your final report, CLEAR staff will be contacting you to arrange an exit interview. These 30 to 45 minute conversations with our recipients help CLEAR to assess the program's impact as well as to document how newly digitized collections are being accessed and used. This is important data for us to collect for our own reporting to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So we hope you'll be able to make yourselves available to conduct an interview with a CLEAR staff member sometime towards the spring of 2021. We will want to give a bit of time for things to develop after the project's over. This way we can discuss how the program has shaped your overall institutional strategy for preservation reformatting of audio collections. We're particularly interested in hearing about how the digitized materials have been used, how you are keeping usage metrics, and what lessons you've learned. The first interview, interviews we've done have been very rich conversations and our team has been learning a lot through them. Here are some points stressed by past recipients that may be useful to you as you get started. First, Metadata creation for AV materials takes a lot longer than originally anticipated for most recipients. For this reason, past recipients advise that new recipients consider how they can lay the groundwork for creating project metadata while waiting for materials to be returned from the vendor. Taking digital photographs of the containers for your recordings may also help expedite metadata creation while the vendor has them. So consider whether it might be possible to do that. Second, get your whole project team together as early as possible to make sure everyone understands individual roles and responsibilities, even if the contributions will only be made late in the project timeline. That way each member can make room on their schedules to do what they need to do in a timely and efficient manner. It's particularly important for the people responsible for ingesting digital files into storage systems or creating metadata for those files to understand what will be expected of them and for them to remain aware of any changes to the project timeline. Don't forget, it's okay to request a grant modification if it turns out that the one year term is insufficient for creating metadata and making it available online. If the recordings, um, Let's see, three. If the recordings to be digitized for your project are part of a larger collection, set aside some additional backup items that, from that collection to send to your vendor as well, just in case the digitization work costs less than originally estimated or um, in case of other unforeseen circumstances. If you get lucky and have extra funds left over, you can then submit a grant modification request to clear seeking permission to authorize the vendor to digitize the backup items as part of the project. And lastly, four, keep notes and documentation for your project in one common place for easy reference, which will make final reporting easier. Determine how you're going to gather the information needed for the project manifest now in particular, which will save you valuable time at the end. We love showing off the excellent work of our grantees. So if there are exciting developments you would like to share with a wider audience, don't hesitate to let us know. Um, please get in touch, that's one of the best parts of our job. One of the easiest ways for us to share your news and accomplishments is for you to tag us on Twitter at ClearRAR so that we can retweet you. If you happen to be describing the Recordings at Risk program in any formal press releases, please let us review the materials ahead of time. We request this because it's very easy to unintentionally say something about CLEAR or about the program that could confuse potential applicants. Approval for your press release should take no more than a day or two at the very most. On that note, this link on the slide here will take you to some acknowledgement guidelines created by our Director of Communications. These provide assistance for a variety of situations such as news releases, social media posts, press events, and so on. We also wanna make sure we're representing you correctly. Your projects are now up on the funded projects page of our website. Please read how your project is described there and let us know if you'd like us to adjust any of the information included. Right now, the text we use came directly from your proposals.
Okay, we made it. Thank you all for attending this presentation. We know we've covered a lot of information here and we'll be sure to post the recording of this webinar as well as the slides, transcript, and Q&A on our recipient's resources page alongside many of the other documents we discussed. If you ever have any questions, you can always reach the CLEAR Grants team at our program email address, which once again is recordings at risk at clear.org. We'll now shift to answer any questions that you've submitted during our presentation. You can add additional questions as we go using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Thanks, Becca. Uh, so while uh, we were chatting, there was one question that did come in. Uh, and it was, are there recommended sites for the publishing of metadata? So I can take this one. Um, we don't have any recommended sites uh, necessarily, but you should have in your project proposal included a plan in the project design section. Um, so this would have included a project timeline, the technical approach that you were going to be using, but you should have put uh, how you were going to make your metadata available in that section of your proposal. Um, so I would recommend taking a look at what you said uh, to see what might come. Um, a lot of the projects, if you're in a library, um, have recommended that they're going to add things to a library catalog. You might have an, a content management system that you use internally, something like Content DM or Past Perfect. Um, perhaps you had proposed making things available through a website, uh, but you should just abide by whatever it is that you said that you were going to do. If you have a more specific question about that that we can sort of help you work through, uh, do let us know and um, we can see if we can help you with any sort of technical guidance on that. So we'll just sort of take a moment to see if anyone else has any questions. We know that this is a lot of information at the start of your project. <laughs> Okay, so uh, William Daw has is asking, do you did you say that we needed to acknowledge clear in the metadata and the finding aids describing the recordings. We did not say that, uh, but we do appreciate when that happens. It makes it much easier for us when we're going in to verify um, project outputs to find uh, what is actually associated with the project. Um, so looking at the acknowledgement guidelines that Becca had referenced and are linked to uh, in our slides that we'll post online, and I think they're linked to on the recipient resources page, give you some vague suggestions about uh, what you might want to include. Um, but if you want something specific, you can email us too and we can um, draft something um, that would be useful. Um, and so the follow up to that is uh, for finding aids, we do find, especially in that format, that most people do include an acknowledgement in the scope note or some other similar section of that uh, to credit CLEAR as the funding source for the project. A uh, follow-up question to the metadata question, uh, what if our library changes platforms? Uh, do we need to notify CLEAR if, for example, 
we said we would use Islandora, but now have content DM. Um, no, not necessarily. I think that's probably something that you can cover in your final report. Uh, so you wouldn't necessarily need to tell us that, um, although in many cases, uh, as you might imagine, for digitization projects like this, we see a lot of migration projects happening right in the middle of digitization work. Um, so sometimes it does require a no-cost extension uh, because you're dealing with uh, delays to processing because of the migration. Um, so yeah, no, unless unless it's going to affect your timeline in some way, you wouldn't necessarily need to let us know in advance. Although we're we're more than happy to commiserate and um, offer you words of support as you work through it. <laughs> Okay, Mary Beth has asked, when you say you can have up to 10 URLs in the accessing the digitized collections page of the report, what would be an example of a URL besides the main location of your project spreadsheet with the metadata? Um, on occasion, projects have um, proposed a plan that would place the metadata in multiple locations. So if they're using um, an aggregator like the Digital Public Library of America or working with another institution where the metadata will live somewhere else as well, um, that would sort of be when you would have a multiple URL situation. Um, sometimes if the metadata will live in two different places, so if it will live in a library catalog as well as a content management system those we might want two different places for that or um, if you're creating a project web page in addition to whatever internal um, system you're using um, there's just there's most for the most part most people will include one url but we we allow for up to 10 depending on the situation Uh, for tracking time and effort of grant activities for staff involved with the process, but not funded by recordings at risk, should we track hours, salary, percentage of benefits, etc., essentially document how much time and money we spend in kind? Uh, we don't have a requirement that you would do that. However, if you listed some sort of cost share, which was not a requirement for the program in your proposal, it might be that at the end you want to report on, on whether or not that cost share match was made. Uh, for us uh, and for the Mellon, we are most interested in seeing how you've spent the awarded funds. But uh, cost shares uh, such as what you've listed can be included in that financial narrative, um, which sort of just show and reinforce institutional support. Um, sometimes it's nice to show that your institution is standing behind the project through staff funding, um, but we don't have a requirement for it. These are great questions, everybody. Um, I was trying to think of any sort of common questions that we get uh, from recipients and when they're filling out reports. I would, I would just say that uh, especially grant modifications are not unexpected with this program. Um, 
don't ever hesitate to contact us about these questions. Working with an external service provider, we know that timelines get messed up and projects get delayed all the time. Um, it's not anything new for this program. So um, please just, just let us know, keep, keep in touch with us so that we can sort of help you through that process. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add, Becca. No, I think that's it. We can wait no. just a, another beat to see <laughs> if anybody else is still furiously typing a question. Uh, so the reminders that we would have for you, if if you'd like for us to include anybody on communications, do be sure to email us their names and contact information so that we can add them. Um, we know if you were hiring individuals, um, that hiring may take a little bit to work through. Um, so send us, send us any project workers that may need to be kept informed about deadlines and uh, other associated information. Um, and just know that we're, or your team is here to support you. We want to see you successfully complete all of your projects. Um, I, I think that's it though. We hope that you all have a great rest of your day and we look forward to seeing how your projects progress. Bye everybody, take care.